for the second lecture, April 1st, Wednesday. We're going to continue on looking at continental shelf ecosystems with our focus being, first of all, the bottom, bottom type, and review a little of the conditions that are responsible for the type of sediment that you find. Remember, there's different levels of waves that are influencing the bottom type. There's different levels of currents that are influencing the bottom type. There's different levels of primary productivity in the waters above, depending on the light and nutrients that are contributing to the type of bottom substrate that you have. So we're going to look at four of the common types of communities that you find in continental shelf in terms of the, the bottoms and see that not surprisingly the uh, there's different communities different members of the community especially in terms of the animals that you find in these benthic communities shaped heavily by the type of sediment that's found there we're going to look at four that are very common some of them very widely distributed in continental shelves others not nearly as common but they have different characteristics in terms of the physical environment and that results in different community members so first of all let's look at hard bottom hard bottom communities the majority of continental shelf substrate is soft bottom so these hard bottom Sometimes there's, there's fairly extensive expanses of rocks and rubble, hard substrate. Now this provides an unusual opportunity for benthic organisms to attach themselves to something. So a lot of this is basically just rocks. Maybe the water moves at a certain rate. Sedimentation in the waters above isn't so great. So you don't have the buildup of sediments that you do in a lot of parts of the continental shelf. And uh, a lot of times it's off of rocky shores, rocky coasts. And sometimes it's interspersed with soft bottom sediment. And so you have patches of hard substrate with hard bottom communities interspersed with soft bottom parts. But basically, one of the main differences is that there's something to attach to. So you have some settling organisms that need to attach themselves to a hard substrate, of course, that you don't find other places on the continental shelf where the substrate is soft. The majority of the, of the substrate continental shelves is soft bottom. And there's varying degrees of the, the particle size for those sediments that has a big influence on what you find there. So there's these Organisms that attach to the bottom that you find in these hard communities, hard bottom communities, that you don't find other places in continental shelf. As far as exploitation of humans for these hard bottom communities, it's not so easy as it is in the soft bottom communities. Where the soft bottoms are, certain places, and it's true of the New England and the Northeast and the, the U.S. in general, there's a huge amount of fishing that's done. These trawls, bottom trawls, are dragged back and forth all over the soft bottom. These are little oases where you can't drag a net across. It requires a different type of exploitation. And you can see this kind of organisms that we looked at, these invertebrates that require, they're not going to burrow into the sediment. They're not going to be crawling around on the top of some soft sediment, but they're going to be a lot more at home in communities where there's a hard bottom, those type of organisms. So here's a photograph that shows some of what you might find down there, the different organisms, different, uh, different echinoderms, nadarians, different types of organisms so you need some place to attach to. So there's some of those pretty sparsely, uh, intermittently distributed around the continental shelf. There's also some where it's not just a like a flat bottom, flat hard bottom that doesn't have very much of a three-dimensional aspect to it, but there's some actual reefs. Now we think of reefs, of coral reefs, where this very productive and all these coral reef organisms, but there's other types of reefs. 
in temperate waters and in cold waters, and the reefs in the respect that it, there's this three-dimensional habitat. It's not just uh, a hard substrate that might be a foot or two off the bottom, but it could be five feet, six, 20 feet, where there's all kinds of nooks and crannies and crevices, and there's these little microhabitats that are created, places to hide, places to attach to, places to move around. And so these it's not just a hard bottom, but it's a it's a, an entire reef with three dimensional uh, habitat that's available. And the, the more complex this habitat is, the more niches there are to be filled and the more diversity you tend to find there. So there's settling organisms, there's suspension feeders. You're not going to find that those are filter feeders. You're not going to find things that are burrowing into the sediment. And in some ways, it's similar to what you find in the rocky inner tidal, except this is always underwater and at much greater depths with less primary productivity, less presence of algae. But there's these settling organisms that attach themselves. And then there's also some more mobile organisms that move around and hide, crawl around. And then, of course, in the water above these, you've got a lot of fish. The fish have places to hide, things to eat. So it's a very good environment for, for a, a lot of fish. There's not a lot of sediment that's deposited here. So a lot of places you have relatively strong water movement, whether that's by waves or currents. So there's a lot of those. It's an entire reef, three-dimensional, and it's composed of rocks as opposed to coral which we're going to look at after this section. This is the majority of what you find in continental shelf ecosystems are these soft bottoms. And so some places are very fine, silty, sandy. Other places it gets to be more coarse, larger sand granules. And it depends, again, on the water movement. It depends on the productivity above the amount of light, the amount of nutrients that's going on. So you've got a lot of things that are burrowers, a lot of burrowers. These different organisms that, that can burrow into the sediment, different worms, different bivalve mollusks, different types of organisms like that. There's not much in the way of hard substrate to attach yourself to. So you've got to burrow or you've got to be fine moving around on the, the soft sediment, or you've been in the, in the water column above the soft sediment. There's a lot of nutrients that make their way down there, a lot of water movement. There's things to be uh, obtained in terms of energy from the sediment, from moving around in the sediment. There's things to be obtained from the water column. And then, of course, if you're a predator, there's things for you to eat. So these are spaced out sometimes with uh, in between rocky or hard substrate, but there's a, a huge amount of continental shelf waters where if you go down to the bottom, it's going to be some type of soft bottom community. The, what varies based on the amount of productivity in the water above, based on water movement, is the, the size of the sediment, whether you're talking about fine silt or whether you're talking about larger granules of sand. All right, the fourth one, which is, isn't widely distributed, but certainly very interesting, very productive, are kelp forest communities. These, uh, by necessity, are in water that's shallow enough for these brown algae, these giant kelp, to attach to the bottom. And it can't be too deep for them to be able to make their way up close enough to the surface to be able to photosynthesize. Now this is actually, it's like a forest. If you look at some of these pictures here, it's forest-like in terms of the this three-dimensional. There's It could be uh, 60 feet from the bottom up to the surface. There's all kinds of different niches to be occupied. Very productive, a lot of energy, 
a lot of places to hide, a lot of settling organisms, organisms moving around in the water, call them all the way to big vertebrates like seals and sea lions. And so it's on the west coast of the U.S. there's giant kelp. There's other parts of the world over in Europe and some other places where these kelp forests, they are forests, but it might be a couple of feet tall as opposed to 60 feet tall like you find in the, with these giant kelp. It's a very interesting community, very dynamic. A lot of different organisms that are found there, including otters on the west coast. And so these are responsible for a lot of input of energy. There's light, there's nutrients, so there's a lot of photosynthesis, mostly by these giant kelp or even smaller kelp in some cases. If you're not talking about giant kelp, they grow very quickly. They, a lot of things can eat this algae. And the algae is a, it's like a tropical rainforest in a way with this huge amount of habitat that's provided. And so you find different types of organisms down on the bottom that are moving around and, and up in the canopy closer to the surface. All kinds of different opportunities for things to make a living. You've got grazers that are going along and feeding on the algae. You've got suspension feeders that are filter feeding. They're either on the bottom or they're attached to the algae. You've got scavengers that are going along, detritivores that are going along eating the organic matter. And then, of course, you've got a lot of predators because there's a lot of different organisms that are found there. There's shelter. There's, there's a, a lot of food. Very productive. Very interesting go someplace like the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They've got a big giant kelp forest tank where you can see this three-dimensional. It's, it's very interesting. And then uh, here's some pictures of these different types of brown algae. There's giant kelp and then there's this smaller kelp that you find that's not going to be 60 feet tall. And as I said, if you go around other places of the world, you can find kelp forests. It's not going to be a huge kelp forest with 60 foot tall kelp. They might be three or four, five feet tall. Still little kelp forests. All right, the last thing that I want to look at, turn our attention to the water that's above the continental shelf. Now this water, as I mentioned in the, the first lecture, there's a different physical characteristics, different chemical characteristics. The water is actually different than oceanic water that's not associated with continents. It moves differently as different chemical properties. And as you would expect, there's different organisms that occupy this. So to begin with, we're going to differentiate between this water that you find above continental shelves. That is the neuritic province. The water that's above the continental shelves is what I'm talking about in terms of having different properties, different chemical and physical properties, and a different biological component. And then if you move away from the continents out into the open ocean or the oceanic province, those are the two main provinces. There's the neuritic province, which refers to water that's above the continental shelf. And then there's oceanic province. People often use pelagic in terms of oceanic, but oceanic is the proper term. And up in the water column, off the bottom, is what pelagic refers to. So you've got pelagic waters in the neuritic province. You've got pelagic environments, pelagic uh, layers in the oceanic province, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about those. In the neuritic province, mostly we're just talking about waters that are above the continental shelves. So you've got this, these conditions, as we mentioned before, where there's a lot of light. The water is usually not that deep. There's a lot of uh, sunlight. There's a lot of nutrients because these are associated with continents. A lot of nutrients coming in from the continents. And so there's a high amount of primary productivity. Some places that we looked at, you saw there's a lot of algae. Other places, there's a lot of phytoplankton, which is the, the major 
primary producer, especially if you get off, off of the bottom and you get on into water that's a little too deep for things to be on the bottom and photosynthesizing. So these areas, they're maybe not the nicest place to dive and, and uh, with a high visibility because they're, they're highly productive. We've been taking advantage of these for a long time. And these continental shelf waters, the water above, we spend a lot of time talking about the substrate and those different hard substrate and rocky reefs and kelp forests. But the water itself, it's only about 10% of the area of the ocean, maybe not even that, less than 10%. But the amount of food that we derive from these continental shelf areas it's about 90% of what we take from the ocean in terms of fish, shellfish, algae, whatever it is that, that we're harvesting from the ocean. A huge amount comes from this relatively small part of the ocean. So there's a, a very large amount of primary productivity, some biology. There's a lot of phytoplankton that are primary producers in these waters. Very good conditions for them. And then they're fed upon by zooplankton. The zooplankton is fed, by, fed on by fish and by squid. And then the fishes are eaten by marine mammals and seabirds. And all the way up to, you've got these phytoplankton that lead to food webs all the way up to whales. Big giant megafauna that's found in waters above the continental shelves. Well, this is the area that we're talking about. This, if you... Maybe you'd find some places that were 200 meters deep. That's getting to the deep edge of, of uh, continental shelf ecosystems. But in terms of photosynthesis, if you look at the amount of photosynthesis that's taking place and the amount of consumption of these products of photosynthesis and other things being eaten, then most parts of the continental shelf waters there's more primary productivity than there is respiration. Or there, there's more primary productivity, more energy being channeled into products of photosynthesis than are being taken from it. And when we move out into the open ocean, we'll see that there's this thin little layer. It does go down to 200 meters, but there's a the upper part of the oceanic waters has a relatively high level of productivity. But one of the challenges out there is that the nutrients are a lot more sparsely distributed than they are in continental shelf waters. You're moving away from the continents. You don't have a big input of nutrients coming from, from land like you do in continental shelf waters. So there's a lot of photosynthesis. And in fact, there's a lot of food that can enter in a lot of energy that can enter into <clears throat> food webs. So as far, far as the primary producers, as I said, you've got some algae, some uh, that are attached to the bottom, but they're in shallower waters or in waters that are clear enough for light to be used for photosynthesis by algae. But all this input of nutrients from land is a very good set of conditions and if you combine that with the amount of light that there is in these relatively shallow waters there's a, a lot of primary production by phytoplankton so we looked at some of these before we looked at in temperate waters where you find diatoms these big primary producers in temperate waters are diatoms other parts of the water like the, the north sea and some of the arctic there's coccolithophores that are the big primary producers. And then when you move in more into warmer waters, more tropical waters, there's a shift from diatoms as the big primary producers to dinoflagellates. And then in shallow water, the Arctic Ocean is relatively shallow. And some parts of the tropics are shallow enough that there's a lot of algae. A lot of green algae and with the kelp forest, it's brown algae. There's other types of algae that are primary producers. And that with the phytoplankton, there's a lot of seasonal changes. There's blooms, big increases in the phytoplankton concentration with seasons.
those seasonal changes that we looked at way back in the in uh, January or early February, which is one of the challenges that phytoplankton have to deal with, these seasonal changes. And in terms of the consumers, now things that are in part of the food web above the primary producers, there are a huge amount of copepods, very, very abundant copepods. These are zooplankton that are feeding on the phytoplankton. Copepods, they're crustaceans. When we look at some, some aspects of the oceanic province, we'll look at copepods as well. But this is one of the, the groups of crustaceans that we looked at when we were doing our survey in, in vertebrates. So you've got a bunch of copepods that are feeding on phytoplankton. They're being fed on by other things, little squid, fish. They make their way up to, up to, all the way up to very big animals. And then there's the filter feeders. There's filter feeding fish. There's a lot of filter feeding fish in these continental waters, continental shelf waters. Menhaden is a big thing on the U.S. East Coast. Anchovies. And there's a herring. And, and uh, there's also whales that are filter feeders sharks that are filter feeders and then you've got some very big organisms that all this production this huge amount of primary production and zooplankton it's a very energetic community in the waters above the continental shelves that's why it's not just us that's taking advantage of all the pr production there but there's a lot of other organisms and then finally, oh, just look at this. You can see there's a typical type of food chain where you've got bluefish that's eating a herring, that's eating these little things. There's zooplankton, a whole bunch of zooplankton, especially copepods. And then you've got all this phytoplankton. Zooplankton starts with phytoplankton, zooplankton, small invertebrates, larger invertebrates, fish. And then this fish could be eaten by a seal or a Whales are coming through here, the biggest animals in the ocean, taking advantage of, of primary production that occurs in continental shelf waters. So it's a very productive type of habitat, something that we're intimately associated with in terms of deriving energy, food, and those kind of things from the ocean. All right, now we've got this one last coastal ecosystem to look at, and that is coral reefs that we're going to talk about on Friday.